Good day, ladies and gents. Welcome to our next work example. This is the second part of an example looking at a back-to-back -back steel angle. But in this section, we're going to look at the design of a steel unequal angle in compression. So it's just half of the previous example, and this is being designed according to SANS 101.62 Part 1. In terms of the example and following this, make sure you've got a copy of the PDF or the hard copy, and also make sure the resolution of your screen is turned up on YouTube just so that you can can see the calculations. So just a reminder of what we're going through. Here we have the section below is a back-to-back -back angle, which is the bottom chord of a truss. It's commercial grade steel. Purlins are spaced at 1,700 mils apart with verticals at each purlin. Knee braces are at every second purlin. There's a six mil gusset plate and then determine the following. We've already completed part A, so this is part B. The maximum spacing of interconnecting gussets between the the angle. So that's what we need to determine. Check using the simple rule in class notes, or it's also in the, um, uh, the South African code, and then do a detailed check on the individual section as backup. So the main part we're actually going to be looking at is calculating the capacity. So just a reminder, we have a truss, looks something like that. And we've got a back-to-back -back angle on the bottom. So here we have two angles forming the bottom cord. There are knee braces every second purlin. So we have this sort of brace supporting our section. And we have these gusset plates. Now, these are about 1,700 millimeters apart. I've ex uh, made the angles and sections not to scale. So they're actually larger than they, they should be, but just so you can clearly see them. We have these gusset plates at regular spacings. Now the question is, when we squash the steel, when the bottom cord goes into compression, will an individual section between points of support be as strong as the entire section, however long it is? So we want to check the capacity of an individual section between uh, gusset plates and between ports so we can determine how many uh, gusset plates we need. Initially, the, init the easiest thing is you normally just add a second or third one if we need an extra one along the way, and then they can help to keep these sections together. So how that would look, for instance, here's our angle, and uh, the markings on previous example, we just have an, a plate that would fit in the middle, and we'd weld it top and bottom just to hold the angles together. These are not continuous all the way down the length. They might be every meter or every 500 mils or something like that, just to hold these sections together and make them behave as a unit. But we want to make sure that the behavior of one angle between points of connection is the same as the combined section uh, in global buckling. So what we need to do, there's a quite a quick and easy check just to make sure that it behaves as we expected. And that is... For a compound section, the slenderness of elements between connectors should be limited to prevent the buckling of individual members. This is done according to. So if we check the D max is the spacing between um, connectors over the minimum radius of gyration. So that's what will govern the capacity of our individual. So this is the individual section. And this part over here is the combined. And what we want to make sure is that the weakest axis of our individual section is the same as the weakest axis of our um, of our global system. Now, often people th would get this wrong because we've got a maximum value here, and they might want to put the minimum value from previous because a minimum gives you a higher capacity. But for instance, if we're squashing this angle coming back, and it has different effective lengths about two axes. One is 100, and the other one's 200. The more slender axis will govern the capacity. So its total capacity, we only need to check against the weakest axis, because it will never load it beyond that. So we're checking that the capacity of individual matches the capacity of our weakest axis. And we're just making sure if the slenderness is okay, it should be approximately the same. Now, this is based on the assumption that flexural buck buckling governs, not lateral torsional or torsional or anything else, but we'll see that soon. So only check the weakest axis about which buckling will occur so that our maximum spacing must be less than 125, uh, 
one, two, three, five millimeters. This we determined in the last example. That's just the KL over R value. Now, this is quite easy to implement. This could be implemented by having a connector halfway between each gusset plate with um, where a vertical member is created. This would create a effective length of 850 mils, um, which would be certainly be sufficient. However, let's do a decent, do a detailed check. Let's say now we set this to be um, that 1235 millimeters long and see what will happen and see what capacity we will get so that torsional or flexural torsional um, are considered. So let's design it as an asymmetric section. We now need to start considering its behavior. And I'm just going to come back to the fundamental equation so you can see why we're about to do what we are. If you use fundamental buckling equations for steelwork, you can derive this equation. This equation tells you when something will buckle, and this is elastic stresses, saying depending on any type of buckling, see so either buckling about the x-axis, y-axis, or z-axis, this you solve this equation, and you will have a the the exact failure uh, stress it goes at elastically. But depending on what the x naught and the y naught values are, parts of these equations disappear. For instance, here, x naught is not zero and y naught is not zero for an asymmetric section. There's no symmetry. The shear centroid and the shear center and the centroid do not correspond. And just as a reminder, so there's our shear, there's our centroid, there's our shear center. They do not correspond. X naught and y naught values exist. Therefore, this whole equation stays in. However, if we have a doubly symmetric section, x naught and y naught are zero. That means some of these terms actually disappear because there's our x naught. So this entire term disappears, and then this entire term disappears because of the values of x naught and y naught, which actually means we're left with a very well-known equation where all we have to do is solve for the roots of this. That will mean the roots are either FEX, FEY, or FEZ, because as soon as FE equals one of those, this equation holds and it will equal zero. So that is why in a doubly symmetric section, EX, EY, and EZ are always the solutions. However, you'll see the code, we're not actually required to determine EZ for doubly symmetric sections such as I beams and HE. That is simply because it will never, um, it's not that it will never but, um, govern, it's just, it, it very rarely, and it's only when it's very short, normally, and so that it's, it's typically ignored. But in theory, we should check all three, but simply because this one so rarely governs, or and it only governs normally at shorter lengths, where it doesn't really matter much, we check these two. However, especially for cruciform sections, this one becomes uh, more important. But now if we get onto a sim singly symmetric section, once again, x naught is 0 and y naught not equals 0, so one term cancels out. The other one doesn't, and when we solve this, then we have the roots of, and that's why when we design a singly symmetric section, we end up with roots like this, that we have, to, and then so we find the maximum of, I mean, sorry, yeah, the maximum uh, of those. Ah, I'm confusing myself here. The minimum, the minimum governs our capacity, so we always take the the, um, the the minimum stress at which something will buckle of those. So as I was saying, so coming back to asymmetric, we have to solve for the roots of this. What is our Fe? Then for this, it'll always be x, y, or z, and for singly symmetric, it'll be then by solving this equation with that term missing, those will be our solutions. So that is why we are doing what we are, and how come we have to solve these equations? Just It's only when we have an asymmetric section we have to use the full equation. The rest of the time, it's, it's a little bit simpler. So now going through the calculations, I'm going to rotate this axis so that the y-axis is positioned as so. I'm just going to rename it to be y-primed and x-primed, so that gives us our geometry. And then, because uh, so the codes and the calculations are based upon an axis convention like that, I swap so Rx primed and Ry primed are based on our original V and U values. I solve for my x naught. I've provided these equations in the class notes, otherwise you can derive them. So that's the distance of the shear center from the centroid, 
based upon those values. And the same thing with the y naught, we can solve the distance along the y-axis from here. That's our y naught value. And then our r naught. These help solve the equations once again. And these we need to solve that equation we were looking at just now. And then there's our um, alpha. If we plug all these in, this will be our buckling stress about x, buckling stress about y. So here you can see if this is much lower. This is about the original v-axis. This is about the original u-axis. So that is our capacity. Then I continue on with our z. So that's our torsional stiffness. In this equation, you'll see that there are normally two terms with FEZ. The first term has a warping torsion in it, CW. For an angle, CW is approximately equal to zero. Approximately equal to zero. If in doubt, you're not sure when CW is zero, look in the, uh, in the red book and you'll see when uh, if a, a CW value is listed, then you know it's not zero. And then otherwise, if there is no CW value, a warping stiffness for a member given, you can take it to be zero. I'm just going to solve for EYZ. We don't specifically need this. Uh, I'm just showing this as a comparison so you can see how it, this is a combination of the Y and Z buckling. So that is not specifically needed, the step, and then along with the alpha. We now need to solve for the elastic buckling stress of this entire equation. So we've, we've calculated x, y, and z, we, we, and the rest of these terms we've got. So Fe is the only unknown. To solve something like this, either we will need a spreadsheet or um, just iteratively on our calculator or such. It gives us something that looks like this. Um, there's the equation, if I run the equation, and I have different Fe, different elastic buckling stresses. We have positions at which failure occur, because to solve that equation, we need to set the equation to zero. So that means those are suitable routes, suitable solutions to it. And we find that based upon this, the lowest one is about 142.8 MPA. So that is then our failure stress. It's a combined stress somewhere between the rest of them. You'll see it's not just X, it's not just Y, it's not just Z, it's actually a combination of them. So it actually ends up slightly lower than the lowest one. There's actually some mode that isn't predicted by the other failure stresses. And so that's where we get the stress from, 142.8. Then we calculate as per normal section or non-dimensional stiffness, and we can get um, our critical uh, compressive resistance, we run through the calcs, and we have a final resistance 58.6. In the previous example, we found out that the total resistance of the whole section is 118, so that would mean each one carries about 59. Hence, this is plus minus okay. Our calculations, we give or take. It's slightly less than we calculated above, but the margin's so small, we're not really going to worry about it. Hence, the connect distance of 1, 2, 3, 5 would be marginally too long as the resistance is lower than calculated above, although approximately okay. So I said this is from the previous example. This is because flexural torsional buckling dominates the behavior rather than V-axis buckling as checked above. However, with the gusset plates not being infinitely thin, the effective length will be less than calculated anyway, so typically not a concern. And that would be is if we had them at exactly 1, 2, 3, 5 apart. However, they are not that. We normally round them off to the nearest uh, sort of whole number. So we take this, and we can't put them at 1, 2, 3, 5 spacing. So we will have them every 850 mils, and that will give us a solution. So that takes us through both. How do we calculate the um, interconnector distance, making sure that the slendernesses are the same for the both systems, the local and the global, and then also how to run through the calculation of the capacity of an unequal angle solving the equations. Thank you very much.